This is Step Up Your Workflow, Advanced Visual Workflow. I am Bill Takis. I am the product manager for Visual Workflow here at Salesforce. Um, if you need to reach me, you can reach me via my Twitter handle, SFDCBill, or you can reach me uh, at, uh, on email at btakis at salesforce.com. Before we begin today, we need to talk about Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor is U.S. securities law. Um, I will uh, leave this slide up for a little bit, but the gist of this slide says, if you're going to make a purchase decision around Salesforce, you need to make that decision based on what we have in the product today, not what we're going to talk about in the future. We are going to show um, some functionality that's in a pilot program today, specifically being able to trigger a flow from a workflow rule. Um, we are working on a new tool you'll hear more about soon to build this, to build these rules, but I, we do need to make sure that you understand Safe Harbor before we begin. So we have plenty of ways to reach um, us at Salesforce, uh, especially on the, on the platform. So you can see a whole list of our social, uh, our social profiles here on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and G+. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, and it will the the deck as well as the recording will be at the same URL that you use to register. It'll take us about a week to get this um, to get that posted, so just be patient. But it will get posted, and it is being recorded. So we did talking a little bit about questions. So if you have questions today, don't you don't have to wait until the end to ask questions. You can post them in the question window in your GoToMeeting control panel. We have a number of people standing by here waiting to answer questions. Um, if you see a question that's already been asked, just be patient. We'll get to it so you don't have to ask it more than once. We will do live Q&A at the end. So one of the reasons you may not see your question answered is it's one of the questions we want to answer live because it requires a, a little bit more conversation. And then if you have any questions after we are done, we have a number of forums on our community sites. There's also a forum dedicated to process automation. Um, we'll show the link to that at the end. So we have a success community there. The Flow community is very generous with their time and information, and they will certainly help you if you have any questions. We also monitor those and chime in when appropriate. So what are we going to talk about today? So we do a, a quick recap of Visual Workflow and its components talk a little bit about um, best practices and debugging. I want to point out uh, a thing that is missed called the fault connector. Show you how to launch a flow without requiring a user. This is our trigger ready flow pilot. It's also known as headless flows. Kind of show you how to build one of those today. And we'll leverage the flow that we used for last time, that we built last time on the last webinar for that. We'll build a new flow that uses a loop to actually do account reassignment. I'll show you how to embed that flow in a Visual Force page. And last but not least, um, show you some, some CSS um, uh, or show you some information around how to use CSS to style the flows on the Visual Force page. I am by no means a, a CSS expert, but I can kind of guide you in some of the things that I've been shown on how to figure out what CSS to manipulate on a Visual Force page with regard to flow. <clears throat> So why do you want to use the Salesforce platform versus other platforms? Well, this slide is a good uh, is a good example of why. Uh, across the top are the things you probably have to do if you use another platform. Um, while you may not have to buy hardware, you're still going to have to set that particular virtual instance of a hardware up. You've got to get uh, user access. You have to. There's a whole host of pieces you have to do that you don't when you use the Salesforce platform. In fact. If you have an idea, you can get a developer account, or if you're a customer already, uh, leverage your Sandbox account and immediately start building against our platform. Now, we have a whole host of tools to meet you wherever you're at with regard to your programming skills. If you're a programmatic developer, we have a whole host of APIs. You can code in your favorite language. You can even use our own language called Apex that's native to the platform in Salesforce. So you can sort of get started today, and you can use the force.com platform, or you can use Heroku to Heroku to build applications. Now, if you're a declarative developer, we have a whole host of tools to meet you there. One of the tools in the declarative tool set at Salesforce is Visual Workflow, very powerful tool uh, to be able to do, you know, point and click coding effectively. Clicks not code is sort of one of our uh, one of our taglines, and you can see that we'll see the power of that today as we go through this. 
So let's talk a little bit about what Visual Workflow is. So as I mentioned, it's a declarative tool set to automate processes across Salesforce. So if you do, if you have a pattern that you do consistently, you do the same sort of clicking and, and maybe data entry or record updating, you can automate all of that with Visual Workflow. So you don't have to do it. A whole host of reasons why that's good. Um, just to mention a few, one, it obviously saves time. Time is money. And the other thing is it can reduce errors. So just a, a quick hit on that. It's extensible via Apex and Visual Force. So you can actually do things like call out to external systems, bring data into a flow via a thing that we have called the process plugin or the Apex plugin, manipulate that data and write it back. So it is fairly extensible. And we'll see today a little bit of how you can style Visual For or Visual Workflows screens in Visual Force. Now we're really working on the ability and continuing to build flow to handle any process related to Salesforce's domain. So marketing, sales, service, and support. We like to call it BPM Lite. We're definitely not out to build a middleware layer as you might think, uh, as you might get from a business process management company, but we do want to make sure that we can automate anything on the platform. So a little bit about uh, what visual workflow is. It's really a, a series of events. You can think of it like a flow chart. And in fact, I'll show you the designer in a minute. I'm sure many of you have seen it already. But it, it can have the sit. We have a number of, the, of logic operators. We have data operations. We have different variable types. All things that you can use to, to automate. Now, before you begin building your flows, you probably want to take a little bit of time to think through um, what objects you want to work with, uh, what variables you might need, what data you're going to look at, um, and some people, especially if it's a complex process, you might even want to whiteboard it out or flow chart it out before you even begin to build. Um, it will really help you save time uh, when you go to, to code your flow, if you will, in the Cloud Flow Designer. So flow has a number of components. So one is the designer, and I'll walk through all of that in a minute. There is a page uh, to manage your flows in setup. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. And then there's what we call flow runtime. So these are the screens that appear. We typically refer to them, at, uh, re refer to flow runtime as the screens that are output by flow. Um, but it really refers to any uh, process that gets executed. So let me take a quick uh, tour um, through the components of Visual Workflow, and then we'll dive back in. So this is the flow management page here. You can see these are all of the flows that I have in this particular instance of Salesforce. Um, it'll kind of tell me if I if I have uh, if I can run trigger ready flows. That's what these run restrictions are. Trigger ready flows can't have any screens or uh, choice elements in them. Anything that would require a user to interact. Um, no trigger basically says I can't trigger the flow. It'll tell me when I when I built it. Um, and who last modified it. Now if I click into a particular flow, flow supports versioning, I can see the multiple multiple versions of the flows I've created. So in this account reassignment flow, I have two versions. Uh, when I go to test the flow, it will actually run the, the most recent version. Um, and if I want to deploy it to my users, I have to make it active. Now one question we get asked a, uh, a lot about is when I deactivate a flow and I go to delete it right away, I can't do that. Now there's a reason for that. The reason that we do that is that in case there's anything in flight, we don't want to stop uh, the flow that's in process. So we'll wait uh, approximately 12 hours and then you'll be able to delete that flow. So something to keep in mind. All right, so let's take a look at the designer just to go through its main components real quickly. So you can see this, the designer looks a lot like a flow charting tool. Um, it has a palette here that you can uh, drag these elements to it and to begin to build your process. Now, as I said, we have a number of different elements. So we have a, a tool that you can, a, a, draft, a draft tool, it's called a step. You can drag these steps. You can think of them like little yellow stickies. Um, but you can kind of build your, your um, flow out if you want to on this canvas and then come back and code it up. Certainly allow you to do that. We have, the, we have a screen element and we have a whole host of things that you can uh, drag to a screen from you know, pick lists to choices to display text to text inputs. We'll see all that in action in a minute here. We have a number of logic operators, so a decision, assignment, and a loop. You can now loop through records in the Summer 14 release. We have a, a number of data operators or data elements. So, um, 
you know, create, update, look up, and delete. There's also these fast elements. The fast elements work with a specific variable type that we have in Flow called S object. And what an S object is, is unlike a standard variable, an S object can contain a record and multiple fields related to that record. S object collections contain can contain multiple records and multiple fields off the record. So it's a variable, an S object variable container is very powerful, and these S object or these fast updates allow you to manipulate um, records a lot more efficiently, uh, conserving some of your limits. Um, but you still have to be careful. You can consume, uh, sub flows can consume other flows, so what we like to say subflows. So you can see all the flows that I have available here. Um, and what you want, why you would want to do that is if you have a very, very complex flow, uh, a good best practice is to chunk that flow up into pieces and then build a flow that consumes all the pieces. So that's really why it's there. And then we have uh, access to action. So if you create an action, it will show up here on the palette. You can drag it to the canvas. Um, and we have both, you know, um, the publisher actions as well as these what we call static actions. One thing I want to point out is if you click on one of these actions and you scroll down over here, you can see that there's a, an asterisk by last name. And what, that, what this little asterisk is telling you is that is the required field by Salesforce to actually create that um, action. So it's giving you a clue of what you need to do to actually leverage the action. So resources, we, as I, I mentioned, we have the different variable types, you know, a standard variable type plus our S object types, constants, formulas, um, a lot of power here. If you have text that you want to reuse in a flow, you can create a text template. We showed that last time. And then your choice elements. And then last but not least, there's the Explorer tab. And what that is for is that anytime you create an element uh, or drag an element to the canvas or create a, a variable, it will show up here in uh, this Explore tab. It's a great way to search for things, especially if you have a complex flow. So that's sort of the flow designer. I'm going to go ahead and close this out and go back to the presentation and talk about best practices here for a minute. So as I mentioned before, design before you build. You certainly can start just dragging stuff to the canvas and coding it up, but I, as you get more experience with visual workflow, you'll find that doing a little bit of planning before will save you a lot of time. You definitely want to think, as I mentioned, think through what data, so what objects uh, you're going to work with and what data you need off of, uh, off of them. You also might want to think through having a convention for your variables. So my convention is var for standard vars, svar for um, s object variables, and svar c for s object collections. Working with IDs to bring data into the flow and not hard coding IDs is a really good best practice. It's a great way to make sure that you've got the right record. You want to test your flows and debug them. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And then you want to be really careful using any data operators in loops. And what I mean by that is sort of your create, update, lookup. Um, if you put one of those in a loop, um, you can, can quickly consume your limits. So we would recommend as a best practice not to do that. Um, but just beware when you're working with a loop, you can quickly consume your limits. And of course, if you have a flow that hits a limit, it's going to roll back all the transactions, so it won't complete. All right, debugging flows. So everybody's probably seen this message if you've worked with flows before. An unhandled fault occurred. Um, basically what this is telling you is that flow, there's been an error in the flow. It's probably related to a data operation. And you didn't tell flow what to do with the error. So it just gave you a generic one because it didn't know what to do. Well, how do I get, how do I get the errors? Well, when you do get an error, flow has a variable in it called um, dollar sign flow system fault message and it will actually assign the error message to that flow system fault message. If you don't tell flow to show you that error, um, it, you're not going to see it. And there's a, within the data operators, you will actually see a thing called the fault connector. We'll take a look at this in a minute. And that fault connector can be dragged to a screen or, and, and it can display the error message or you can send yourself an email. So that's one way to sort of handle the fault connector and, and actually see what's causing the problem. Um, you will get an email message when an error is generated um, and, and, you, and each time an error is generated. So you should get the message in an email, but in terms of expediency's sake to make things faster for you and cleaner, use the fault connector with that system fault message variable to display the 
to display the error. Um, another best practice is, is that when you're working with trigger ready flows, you can have screens. However, you can create email messages that will actually send you data. So before you enter, uh, for example, before you enter a data operation, one thing you can do is dump out the contents of the variables that you're going to work with in that data operation and send them to yourself or likewise use a screen if you want to to show you um, what the variables contain before you actually start working with those variables. So essentially what I'm saying is output the information sort of step by step through the flow, get it running, and then you can take all of that out and you'll have a good idea, you'll, you'll know your flow works and it'll be able to debug it. Um, it's definitely on our priority or record. Again, I want to remind uh, Safe Harbor, we are going to continue to iterate on improving not only debugging, but the error messaging of flow. Um, you'll certainly see that in a couple upcoming releases, but definitely sort of on our radar. All right, I want to show you one of the flows that I built today. We're going to go in this flow in depth in a moment. But just to get an idea of what the fault connector can look like. So if you see right here, this is a, I'll go in depth in this flow in a moment, but what, what happens if I hit an error here, I have, I'm going to open this up. You can see that this close fault message variable is here. It will actually show me the error, the, the error that the API is returning to us when there's an error. So that's um, a good idea, uh, best practice to use these fault connectors. All right, so let's talk a little bit about trigger ready flows. So if I'm going to walk through this really quickly. So this is a flow we built last time. I won't dive into each of these in the uh, instance of time. But if you recall last time, this flow actually does some lead processing. And we pass into the flow via this variable called var lead ID, the ID of the lead. And in this instance, I've created a web to lead form. When that, and I have a workflow rule configured that every time a lead is created to fire this flow, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute, but let's walk through the flow for those that weren't on the call last time. So I get that lead ID, and I have a number of pieces of data that I bring along with the lead in an S object variable. So I get the ID, the owner ID, first name, last name, you can see all of these things. And the things that I really need right now is sort of the state and the city. So I come down to this decision and I determine whether or not the lead is in California. And if it is in California, I go down this branch. And if it's not, I go down, in this, down this branch. And what this lead processing flow is doing is it's assigning the appropriate salesperson to the lead. So if it's in California, It'll actually go to this decision. It'll determine whether it's in NorCal or SoCal, and you can see that I've, I've got a number of cities here. Obviously, I don't have all the cities in Southern California and Northern California, but it gives you an idea. You could certainly do this on zip code as well, um, but it's a, a decision to decide what rep it should go to. If it's in Southern California, it will assign the title to a variable called var rep title. And that's important because that's how we, we reassign the lead to that rep. Um, likewise, if it's for NorCal, we assign it to NorCal sales manager. And if it's not in California or it's a city that we haven't coded, it'll get assigned to the VP of sales, and that's what this one does. So the next thing we do is based on that title, based on that title, remember this is the variable that we put the title in with that assignment and operator, it'll look up the, the rep, and we get the rep's ID, their first name, last name, and email. The next thing we do is assign the lead to the sales rep, and we do that with ID. So I have the rep's ID here, it's in that variable from that, from that lookup previously, and I set the owner uh, of the lead to the rep. Then I do an update, I update the lead's owner, and then I create a task for that person to, um, to follow up with the lead. I've also got a formula in there that sets the due date one day after the lead's been created. All right, so let's go take a look at the workflow rule and how you want to do that. 
So to create a workflow rule that triggers a flow, and as I mentioned at the beginning, this is all part of a pilot program called Trigger Ready Flows. If you are not in this program and desire to have it turned on, please contact your account exec, tell them that you want to be part of the Headless Flow Pilot or Trigger Ready Flow Pilot. Um, you can certainly contact me and I can help you find out who your account rep is, um, but we can get you into the pilot. The one thing we do ask is that you have built at least a couple of flows, you have some practice before you enter the pilot and sort of advanced functionality. So remember a workflow rule, in this instance I'm just going to use account, I'm going to click next, I'm going to give it a, a name. This is how you actually build a flow trigger or a workflow rule that triggers a flow. I'm going to say every time this is created, let's just say the created date is not equal to null. I'm going to leave that blank. And then the next thing I want to do is the workflow rule will say, hey, what actions do you want to fire? Well, in our case, we want to fire a flow trigger. And that's what this does. And I can give this trigger a name. I'm just going to It'll populate that. I know the objects account. And then right here, I'm going to get a list of flows that are trigger ready. And remember, a flow is trigger ready if it has no screens or choices in it. And then the other thing I can do once I've, I've created that is I can populate the flow with data uh, based on the variables that I have in the flow and the object that I'm working with. So in the, in the case of the account, I could say lead ID and I could put the ID in here. Of the, in this case, it'll be account. This could be lead. I'll show you what the lead one looks like. I could create a description. If you want to test your flows, you want to check this box so you can test them without having to have them activated. And I can save that. And so I'll now have a workflow rule that operates on account. Let me show you the workflow rule that I have for leads. So you can see I have this lead processing flow. It has a flow trigger. It has a lead processing flow trigger. And what this trigger does is actually fire the flow and pass in the ID. So let's see this in action. So I've created a web to lead form out here on a website I have. Um, I have a little lead form. And if I click Submit, I'll be redirected to the page. And if I go up to Leads, we should see that this has now been assigned to Josh Stevens. So here's my lead, and it's assigned to the appropriate rep. So that was just a, an example of how to use a trigger-ready flow uh, with the flow. So the steps are create your flow, create a workflow rule that fires a flow, create a flow trigger, and in that flow trigger, pass in any data that you need to make the flow work. Okay. That's trigger ready flows. All right. So the next flow we're going to build, and feel free to um, follow along here. I will go a little slower. What this flow does is it asks a user for the name of, a, uh, of an account owner to reassign their accounts. And what, how it will work is hot accounts will be assigned to one user based on the rating, warm and cold accounts to another user. So there's a couple of things that we're going to need to do this. We'll ne obviously need a loop because we want to be able to loop through all the records and figure out what their rating is and assign them to the correct owner. We're going to need a screen to collect the um, usernames. I use username instead of email in this case. 
you're going to want to use fast lookups to grab all of the records in it and, and you'll need an S object collection variable to do that and then you'll need a um, an email I have an email action uh, set in there to actually email that there's been an update so let's go ahead and go through this flow all right so the first thing we want to do is create a screen element now I, the element I, I've, I've named it inner usernames and I've, I've got a text box here with a label that says inner usernames whose accounts need to be reassigned and then I have I started with email addresses but you could use email addresses or usernames for the people who you want to give accounts to so assign hot accounts to uh, one user and warm and cold counts to the other user, other accounts to the other user. Now, if you notice here, I've got a unique name, user user one underbar username, user two underbar username, and user three underbar username. These text inputs will all be used and referenced later in the flow. Now, the other thing I've done is you can do validation on uh, text entry fields in Visual Workflow. Um, if you know regular expressions, you can use any regular expression to validate text. Uh, this one I actually grabbed off the web. It's out there and I'm, I believe it's also in our documentation. Uh, this will actually validate if somebody puts in a valid email address. So if you put, you know, Bill and a bunch of characters without an at, at, at sign, it'll tell you it's wrong. And in fact, it'll give you this error message which says, please enter a valid email. So that's sort of the first step, collect your usernames. The next thing we do is based on that first text field, user1 underbar username, look up the user. And we're going to create another variable called sbar user1, that's an s object variable. And what you want to get off of that is the ID, the first name and last name of the rep. And you're going to do that again for the second user. And you'll do that again for the third user. And obviously, if you look here, username 3 underbar username or user 3 underbar username equals username get that particular user I have an s object variable for that user and contains all their info now if you notice I have my fault connector here that'll tell me if I run into any errors while I'm working with this flow now the next thing we want to do is we want to go get all of the accounts that belong to the person that we that whose accounts were reassigning so that very first um, the very first username we input, we've got their data in the S object variable, S var user one ID. So look up what this is saying is give me all of the accounts whose owner ID equals this ID. That's what this statement does. And then I have an S object collection variable called user one under bar accounts, and I'm going to get the ID the rating, that's a criteria for reassignment for us, it's a decision criteria, and the owner ID, we'll need the owner ID so we can do the reassignment. So you can see I have a fault connector out here as well. Now the next thing we want to do is use a loop. Now how loops work is you need to declare a variable where you can, where you can store the collection inside the loop. So you have the collection itself here and then you want to declare, a, we'll call it a working variable inside the loop. So what it'll do is it'll literally record by record add it to that loop variable as it's looping through. Um, sort of record by record and you can choose an order by which you want to loop through ascending or descending or you can leave this blank either way. So the next thing we want to do is figure out what user needs to get assigned to what account and we're doing this via rating so you can see I have an outcome right here called hot so if it's a hot account I'm saying that this s bar account loop var so remember that's this is a variable we declared uh, the working variable we declared in the loop dot rating so I'm saying if this records rating is equal to hot go down that branch and then if it's not I set the default outcome to hot or cold so the flow will know if it's hot go down one side, if it's cold or warm go down the other. And then the next thing I do is I'm saying if the account owner, the owner ID is equal 
equals the account, sorry, the working variable dot owner ID. So this is the loop variable. So the first time through the first record that it finds is hot, make that equal to the owner ID of user two. And then I assign that particular record into a new S object collection variable called S var collect updated accounts. So we have a working, we have a number of variables at play here. So the first variable is the collection of records. The second variable is the loop variable. So that's the variable that stores, you know, each record as it iterates through the loop. And then we have a third variable to create the updated collection. And we do the same thing on the warmer cold side. So as far account loop, um, sorry, as far account loop var dot owner equals user ID three. And then we put that into the collection and then we exit the loop. So what this will do is loop through that first user, all of the first user's accounts. It'll assign the appropriate or owner based or warm or cold. Then we come out of the loop and we leverage that collected account variable, this S far collect updated account variable to do a single um, update. And then we give a confirmation to folks saying, hey, every, everything's been reassigned. So that's, um, that's the flow. Now let's go ahead and, and run this and see what it looks like. So before we do that, let's take a look. You can see that um, Josh Stevens, I know who these people are, and John Ward own all the accounts. So let's reassign Josh's account. So I'm going to say Josh. I'm going to reassign them to myself. I'm going to click next. And it's saying it's been signed. Oh, I have a little error here. I don't have an exclamation point. You can go back and finish that. So let's go over here and hit refresh. And you can see that I've now been assigned all of Josh's accounts. I own his cold accounts and I own his hot, hot accounts. So that's sort of how the flow works. Okay, I'm going to attempt to try to create an error. So the first thing is my validation rule took over. If you remember that regular expression I had saying, hey, you don't have a valid email address. And I didn't get it right the second time either. Now, this is a system fault message. And if you remember, I have different screens coming out of each node in the flow. Go back to the flow designer. So these are all the fault messages and we've generated one. And what it's saying is, is that it's saying updated accounts, the upsert failed because there's an owner ID is blank. So what that means is to decode this, it means that you put in an, a username that I couldn't find. So when I went to look up the username, it wasn't there. I, I put it as a null value. And when I did the update, it, it set it to null. There's nobody there, so it gave you an error. So that's what this means. And I know it's on the update because I put this updated account um, element, and it's passing the element name. And I'll show you where that is. So if you look at this screen right here, updated accounts, that's where the error message is generated. Okay, so nothing happened, no transaction happened, no harm, no foul, but at least you know uh, what's going on with the process and sort of saw an example of how to use the fault connector and the system fault message. All right, let's talk about creating a visual force page with visual workflow. Now you want to, the reason you want to use a visual, uh, you might want to use a visual uh, force page is that you can control its styling, you can control the flow buttons, you have a little bit more control of sort of the flow's output. 
Now, this is something that we're actually working on. Again, Safe Harbor, you'll start to see improvements in Flow's runtime and your ability to style over the next, over multiple re coming releases. Um, right now, we're actively working on sort of making the mobile experience, improving the mobile experience, sort of more to follow on that. So to create a Visual Force page, you would, you would go to Setup, go to Develop, and Create Pages. And for a basic flow page, the only thing you need to do is type in this a, these Apex tags, Apex, um, or open bracket Apex colon page, and then you need a closing tag slash Apex colon page. And the only thing you really need to put in here is this statement right here, put the flow interview name. Now, in this particular one, I've set the finish location to a different, to the home, to the home screen of, of, of uh, Salesforce. And I've put the button location on the bottom. So this is just a really basic page. I'll show you what this looks like. Let's reassign John's accounts to me. And when I click finish, it will redirect me to home. So that's just a basic Visual Force page. Now, if I want to deploy this page onto a tab, I would go to create, and I would go to tabs. Now, in fact, I have that open here. And you can see there's Visual Force tabs. I have a Visual Force page here already called reassign accounts. We'll look at that in a moment. But I've, I've been able to create a uh, um, sort of an icon for it, this wrench icon. You can see that here. I also have some additional styling. The styling I put in is I've actually given the page some text um, and I'll show you how to manipulate the CSS here in a moment. So how do you manipulate the CSS? How do I figure out what to do? Again, I will say I'm not a CSS expert, but there are a few tips and techniques I've learned um, over, the, uh, over the course of a few years. So one, to actually see what particular element that you want to manipulate, you need to look at um, a developer tool. In Google Chrome, you can go to View, Developer, and Developer Tools, and it'll bring up a console down at the bottom. If you look over on the right-hand side of the console, you'll see all of the CSS here. And to figure out what to actually manipulate, you could use this little um, search or spyglass element here and sort of click on the elements that you want to look at. And if you scroll through the CSS, you can see various um, you'll see various um, pieces of the CSS, and so this is a common, common part of the page sheet, common.css. And what I'm looking at here is the page block and the label. I want to manipulate the labels a little bit. And you can practice or manipulate or, um, or experiment here, so I'm going to turn off the text alignment right, and you can see everything move to the left. That might be useful if I deploy this to mobile, and I'll show you how to deploy the flow mobile in a moment. All right, so you can get sort of um, page, I know that it's the page block and the label column, label column that I want to manipulate. So we go back to our Visual Force page. I'm going to close this one. And I'm going to open this particular one right here that I've done some styling with. So there's a couple of things that you might notice with this particular one. So let me, let me start here. The first thing you want to do is you want to put the flow screen that you're working with into a container. And that container is called a div. And you can see down here that I have a div tag. I've given it the ID the flow and I've told it what the flow name is. Um, I've also said I want the buttons on the bottom. So wrapping it in a div will allow you to override the CSS for that particular piece that you put in the div. So just think of it a container and then the things above it you can style um, based on overriding the CSS. And div just stands for divide. So the first thing I've done is overwritten the button. Um, and what I've done is um, made the button be in line, I've floated it left, I've changed the font, and I've changed the height. 
The next thing I've done is I've just created a text. If you remember, you saw that reassign accounts text. I just put some text in here, and I've also given it some styling as well. Now, the other thing we'll do is we're going to put a little CSS in. I have a little CSS ready to go um, that's around the alignment. And I'm going to align it left. And I'm going to put that in there. And I'm going to save this. And we can preview it. And so you can see the button's been manipulated. The labels are over on the left. So that's a quick um, overview of how to manipulate the CSS. Now, how do you make this thing mobile? That's fairly straightforward as well. So what you want to do is you want to come up here to Mobile Administration, click on Mobile Navigation, and you'll see any of the Visual Force pages, any Visual Force pages that you have show up uh, on this side that's available. And if you just click them over here, um, they'll show up on S1. So right here I have the reassign accounts. If you remember that little wrench I put, I'll show you what that's for in a second here. So I've made it mobile. I'm going to go ahead and log into Salesforce here, hopefully. And it's logging in. And you can see that the text is, uh, you know, a little bit better. You know, it's, it's functional. It's not perfect. I could probably put some more space between this line. I'd have to go back to the, the CSS tool, or sorry, the developer console in Chrome. Firebug has, or sorry, Firefox has a tool similar to the Chrome's developer tool called Firebug. But you can see that I can uh, actually manipulate the mobile flow here. Now you can see the button's a little bigger, it's in line, it's centered, and the tool I'm using here to look at it in a mobile format is I'm using Xcode on the Mac and I have the iOS simulator app. Um, let's go ahead and assign some accounts. Let's take my accounts and assign them to Josh. Or sorry, that's my accounts. And finish we go. So let's go back and look to see if Josh actually has accounts. And lo and behold, he does. He now owns all the accounts. All right. So what we've covered today is how to um, trigger a flow without requiring user intervention, a headless flow. Remember, you do that by creating a workflow rule. You have that workflow fire a or workflow rule fire a flow. Create a flow trigger and you can pass in data via that flow trigger. So that was sort of the first thing that we did. The second thing we did is we built a flow with a loop. It collects three usernames. It grabs all of the records for username one with an S object variable. It loops through uh, leveraging uh, a loop variable. And we have a third S object collection that actually collects each updated record. And then we do a fast update and we give a confirmation. So that's sort of what we've shown today on how to use Flow. We have a survey out online. So if you go to bit.ly slash advflow, please go there and fill in uh, the survey. We definitely want the feedback, um, I'm sure. And if you have additional topics you'd like to have us talk about, please put that in the survey. Dreamforce is just around the corner. I forget how many days, but October 13th, we still have a discount code for developers. So you can see D14DVLPR. So if you're going uh, or planning to come to, to Dreamforce, uh, please use that code. Um, we will, I will be at Dreamforce. Uh, my colleagues will be at Dreamforce. Our developers will be at Dreamforce. So please come, bring your questions. It's a great way to um, get sort of really um, 
uh, deep knowledge and obviously get your questions answered. We'll be running a number of sessions on visual workflow uh, there as well. And as I said, I'll be available, our, our development, development team will be available. So it's a really great way to get lots of good information. We also have a conference coming up in Indianapolis um, at the end of September. And we have a free develop, developer pass. So Heroku will be there, Force.com will be there, Exact Target will be there. We'll talk about our open source efforts. So if you're anywhere in the area and you can get to Indianapolis uh, on the 23rd, uh, it's a, a, again, developers will be there, product managers will be there, lots of good information on, on, our, um, on, the, uh, on the Exact Target side. Um, and it, again, the platform team will be there. All right, last but not least, Q&A. Couple of things I wanna point out. If we don't get to your question, we will definitely answer it. If you walk away from this webinar and have a question, you can certainly reach me via Twitter or uh, on email. Uh, likewise, uh, make sure you write down uh, this particular thing right here, um, bit.ly slash success QA. That will take you to our process automation community site. Um, again, the Flow community is great about answering questions. Um, we're certainly monitoring that and answer them um, as well. So let's take a few questions. All right, we're pulling out some questions now. Just give us a few seconds. Bill, here's a common question. That's Shelly Ursic. She's a co-product manager of mine. She's the workflow PM. She's going to have lots of great news coming up in the middle of September, so stay tuned. Thanks, Bill. Um, a common question we're getting is, can you talk about the difference between the fast elements, so a fast lookup or a fast create, and a regular record lookup and record create? So the fast elements are really designed to be used with our S-object variables, and the, the reason that we have them is they're designed to save you from hitting your limits. So in the case of that update, when I did that update, what's happening in the background is it's only doing sort of one update to that entire collection. So you're only consuming sort of one limit instead of, you know, hundreds of them. Um, in the case of some SOCAL operations, that isn't always the case. You're still going to have your um, uh, query limits. But the S object variables are designed to save you uh, from hitting your limits. Limits still apply. It's easy to hit them, especially when you're working with hundreds of records. Uh, it's a good way to think about, uh, you have to think about how to chunk up your flows operation so you don't hit limits. And then your standard variables are, can be used with just the standard um, data operators, your record create, update, lookup. Great. Can you talk about which elements are GA versus which are actually in pilot with regard to the flow trigger and headless flows? Right, right. So headless, the headless trigger ready flow functionality is GA in visual workflow. Now the only way that you can trigger that right now in a, in a GA way is through an APEC start method. So you have to, you would have to, in those visual force pages that I had there, you would have to have some, some visual, uh, some Apex code using Apex start to fire the flow. Little complicated, programmatic, not declarative. What is not GA, GA is firing that flow from a workflow rule. So if you remember when I built the workflow rule and I built the trigger, those pieces are not GA. And the reason, we get asked the reason, so I'll just say it. The reason is, is that we're actually working on a new tool to do that. Um, as I mentioned, Shelly's going to have some news um, here in, in a couple of weeks. Stay tuned for that, but we're, we're working on an improved way to build those triggers. Can you talk about flow in mobile? And clarify, can a flow be triggered from a mobile device? If so, how? Are there any caveats around that? So, yeah, so, yeah, so the, <laughs> the first thing I'll say with mobile flows are, as you can see, styling them is not necessarily the easiest thing to do in the world. You kind of have to manipulate CSS. Uh, the output, the, the flow does on screens is, you know, there's some effort there and it's programmatic, not, I would say it's programmatic, um, more programmatic than declarative. Can you trigger a flow? Uh, you certainly can. If you saw the, um, I, 
uh, was using the iOS simulator, so it's actually talking to Salesforce One. Um, granted, that was in a browser, but if for those of you that don't know, if you go to your Salesforce instance slash one, the word one, so slash one slash one dot app, you'll actually get the um, S1 version of Salesforce. Let me do it with. Let me show this here real quickly. So you can test your flows. Now, can you fire a trigger ready flow? Sure thing. So this is sort of what the um, um, what S1 looks like. I can obviously change the screen size, um, you know, to make it look more like that factor. I have the iOS simulator here. It's sort of showing me the same thing. But you can your flows right now will actually show up on uh, the left hand side of Salesforce One. Now, in an upcoming release, we're going to improve Flow's screen output so that it, it is much more in the style of Salesforce One. So when you create these mobile flows, it will know that it's on mobile and it will style it appropriately. Um, it'll give it a, a, a nice look and feel. Um, if you come to Dreamforce, we'll certainly be showing that, um, something that we're working on right now. We had a couple of questions about whether or not you could submit an approval from, from Flow. Um, Right now, if you're part of the headless flow pilot, you will get permission. Let me go back to Chrome here. You will get permission to have an action. Let me get to the right place. Uh, submit for approval action. Now, this will actually fire an approval process. The reason that we didn't GA it in in summer 14 is there's no way to specify the submitter, and we're working on that right now in the winter. 15 release, so the next release of Salesforce, that action will show up for everybody and you will be able to specify the submitter. But you can do it today, it's just whoever launch, whoever whoever launches the flow is going to be the submitter. Um, just something to be, I mean you can do it, just something to be aware of. Does the flow impact API limits? It, 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 you know what? I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I believe that it does. I believe that it does. So flow, what's happening underneath is when you use, um, consume any of the data operators, we're actually making API calls. So it's all sort of hidden. I believe you will consume your API limits, um, but I, let, let me double check that to make sure. And you can tweet me. You can tweet me. Great. Can you talk about what's coming next for Flow? Sure. The, um, there's a couple of things on the path for Flow. So I talked a little bit about um, mobile, having mobile flows styled a little bit better. In the very next release, um, we'll, you'll see a new um, logic operator. It's going to go in the operator section. So it'll, on the palette, it will um, show up here called wait. And flow uh, will now be able to wait for time. So a use case could be if you have a subscription business and you have renewals, you could set up a flow that will wait and start firing, say, 30 days before the flow. And it can kick off a branch of operations to do things like set up reminders and tasks. And within that wait node, you could have it wait for 30 days out, 20 days out, 10 days out. Um, and constantly remind people to go to go after that particular business. Um, there are a myriad of other use cases, but the wait element is um, going to, and time is the first event that we have uh, that Flow will be able to wait for. In subsequent releases, where we will enable you as a user to create your own event. So one event, as an example, one event in the future you might want to wait for is an external system call, um, as an example. Um, so the wait is, and the other thing that we've done in the next, in the upcoming release is we've improved some of our error messaging, debugging, um, so that's in there as well. Great, Bill, we're getting a number of questions. People really like your demo and they wondered if there's any way that you could share that with them or if you have any plans potentially sure. to on the app exchange yeah. or something we, uh, to sort of put that, access that. We'll put it out there. I'm not sure exactly what. We'll either put it in the app exchange or we'll create an unmanaged package so you can grab it uh, off this instance. 
Um, also, lots of questions for folks who, who haven't used Flow very much and want to find guides and getting started places, the places to get started. We'll post those resources as well. Um, we One thing we did work on for Dreamforce is we have rewritten the Cloudflow workbook with much more contextual examples. So for example, there's a, a, an actual discount calculator and a process around it instead of a tip calculator. Um, the reassignment flow that you just saw is one of the ones that we've done as well. Um, so we've really tried to expand that uh, tutorial to meet all of the new pieces of flow. I mean, but we'll, we'll figure out how to get these resources and these flows out to you. I think we have time for one more. Um, will Flow be able to trigger chatter messages? Yes. In an upcoming release, um, one of the actions that will be there is post a chatter. Um, and if you search on the web, there are a number of, uh, of Flow users who've done a lot of work leveraging Flow and chatter. Uh, Rakesh, um, if you search for Rakesh Gupta, um, he he he's a he's a flow machine. He puts a fl like a flow out every week. But he's done a lot of work. I want to you know point him out that he's done a lot of work, um, as well as the rest of the community. But I've noticed Rakesh has done a lot with Chatter, so you might want to Google him. And if you go to the Success Community, let me put this slide back up. If you go to the Success Community right here, um, you'll find him there. Great. Sneak one more in. Yeah. Um, can we make a web service call? You can make a web service call with the flow. Um, the way you have to do that is you have to write Apex code to, to do your call out, and then you have to um, use what's called the process.plugin, the Apex plugin, to call that plugin. But you can output inf in information to that particular web service call and then have it return. You have to make sure you set your variable types correctly to input and output, but that's entirely possible. Um, one thing that the process automation team is working on is if you notice the actions in the last, you notice the actions that are all there, um, we are working to enable you to build your own actions. So one of the actions that will be coming is a flow action. We'll also be uh, evolving that to have an apex action. Um, so that'll really, um, it, instead of having to use a process plugin, it'll still be there. You'll be able to use it, especially if you have flows built. But the Apex action will make it even easier. And, uh, you know, we're actively thinking about how we, we know that that's a common use case, how we enable that use case to be, you know, as, as declarative as possible. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I appreciate it. Um, you know where to reach us. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thanks.